Thank you for being here today. You're about to be treated to something you very seldom see, which is a talk here in computer science and engineering where someone is not reading PowerPoints to you. So I think we owe her a round of applause for that right off the bat. <laughs> so uh, Kim Palese has a long career as an entrepreneur. She uh, got a bachelor's degree from Berkeley in biophysics. And then I've forgotten how you wound up in Seattle, but spent a few years here and took a set of our courses while uh, in Seattle here at UW. I went back down to the Bay Area, worked in expert systems, worked at Sun Microsystems for a number of years where she was involved in rolling out the, uh, uh, the sort of original Java effort, uh, founded and ran a company called Marimba for uh, many years and is on to uh, a couple companies after that and is here today to talk about uh, the whole sort of uh, valley entrepreneurship uh, approach and how it's worked for her. So thanks a million for being here. Thank you, Ed. <laughs> And um, thank you for coming today. It's a great pleasure to return uh, to the University of Washington and um, have the opportunity to not only reconnect with folks here, but also see the beautiful Paul Allen Computing Center and also get a chance to see some of the amazing research that's going on. And in fact, the impact that UW's computer science program is having on the world is, in a word, extraordinary. I, I kind of knew that coming in, but I... I didn't realize the, the scope and range of the projects going on. So it's, it's really exciting to be here. And next time I have to spend more than a day, clearly. Um, and when Ed asked me to come and speak at this symposium, I was honored. And I thought it would be a good opportunity to just talk a little about my experiences of founding and building companies in the Valley over the past almost three decades. Uh, but I also am not going to talk the whole time. So I'm happy to take questions if we have time at the end. Um, you know, over the last three decades, I've had the privilege of working on some pretty extraordinary projects uh, and with some amazing people. And I'm currently I'm not CEO, so for the first time in the better part of the last 15 years or so, I am actually taking a break from being a CEO, and I'm actively advising companies, um, serving on boards, investing, and um, helping a number of early stage companies uh, come to market. And these companies range from software to mobile to education and finance. And the common theme between each one of these companies is that they are all charting radically new approaches to solving the greatest challenges in their respective domain, large-scale challenges. And that's, to me, I mean, it doesn't really get much better than that. And I'm actually reminded on a daily basis of how extraordinary it is to have the opportunity to be in a place and time where I get to work with teams of smart, motivated people who are fueled by the desire to innovate and change, transform the world for the better. And, and of course, in every one of these fields, computer science is the foundation. Computing is the foundation and, and really in every major area of innovation today in the world. And that ranges from medicine, to construction, to uh, architecture, even the legal world. Computing is really at the foundation. And it's, it's remarkable to think that computer science was actually a relatively new major as recently as the 1970s. And today, when you look at the impact computing has on every, not only industry, but element of daily life, uh, it is truly profound. And yet, as a society, we really aren't investing nearly at the level in teaching computer science that we need to be in order to fill 21st century job openings uh, and also, even more importantly, address our greatest global challenges. Simply put, we have a major supply problem. And if you look at the numbers, I mean, that's that just, it's, it's very stark. The Bureau of Labor Statistics actually reports that over the next decade, this current decade we're in, over 60% of all jobs and over 70% of newly created jobs are in a category called computing, computer operations, computing operations. Uh, I'm sorry, computer occupations, computer occupations. And the great majority of not only that, but the great majority of science and engineering jobs are, in fact, in computing. So clearly, that's where the jobs are. But if you look at the number of graduates in computer science, only 2.5% of college students in the US today are graduating in computer engineering. And that is actually about half the number of psychology degrees being awarded. And not only that, that's about one sixth the number of social science and history degrees being awarded every year. So the gap between supply and demand is clearly 
outstanding, uh, astounding, <laughs> outstanding, no, out astounding, yes. And then when we look on top of that at the number of CS degrees being granted to underrepresented, un underrepresented populations like women and min minorities, the difference or the problem is even more stark. So again, a few statistics that really bring that into focus. The number of women that were graduating, the percentage of women graduating with CS degrees hit a high in 1984 when I graduated from UC Berkeley. That was 37%. 30% of all degrees in 1984 went to women in computer science. It was down to 26% in 1998 and by last year, 2011, the percentage of women graduating in computer science had declined to less than 12%. That's one third of what it was when I graduated from college. This is crazy. This is nuts. At a time when we need a greater supply than ever before of CS grads, this trend is clearly going in the wrong direction fast. And the problem is not just that we need more computer scientists. It's increasingly that the jobs of the 21st century will require computational thinking. Today, every domain and every, really, every industry has increasingly is depending on computing. Biologists, for example, depend on inf information science, even if they're not doing computational biology. Biology is no longer rooted in the study of taxonomies. Today, it's depending on developing entirely new ways to synthesize and analyze huge amounts of data. Similarly, another example, the forefront of linguistics is increasingly dominated by quantitative analysis. Computer scientists, in fact, are applying analytics to decode ancient languages more accurately and quite a bit faster than some of the best linguists in the world, and so on, for every, every industry, every domain, and really every element of modern life. So how do we equip people for this computational world? We're clearly not doing a good job in terms of graduation rates in computer science or teaching computing. The urgency is great. What's needed first and foremost is an awareness of the problem. I mean, I wasn't even aware of how bad it had gotten until I started looking at the numbers. In addition, we need political will, attention, focus, funding, and we need to figure out new engaging ways of teaching computing and computer science at a far greater scale. This really is no time to think small. We need to take an entrepreneurial approach. We need to be audacious. So what does it mean to take an entrepreneurial approach? What is an entrepreneur, anyway? Well, I like what Guy Kawasaki says. He says, being an entrepreneur is not a job title. It's a state of mind who peop of people who are changing the world. It's a state of mind of people who are changing the world. And so you can be an entrepreneur at a very large company, uh, as well as a startup. And if there's one thing that I've learned over the past three decades in Silicon Valley, it's that really nothing interesting happens by iterating. The interesting stuff happens when you take a huge audacious goal and pursue it. Iteration is not what led to the invention of the integrated circuit or the iPhone. Audacity did. But disrupting the status quo is not for the faint of heart. Being too early, in fact, is an occupational hazard. And if you're an entrepreneur, you get used to it. And in fact, basically every project that I've been involved in in the last three decades of a career in Silicon Valley, with starting back to AI in the 80s, was ridiculously early. It takes time for the rest of the world to catch up. And uh, on top of that, important dependencies are often outside of your control. The key, I've learned, is to figure out how to innovate in the world that exists today while you continue driving towards your audacious vision. And a great example of that is the story of Java. In 1989, I went to Sun Microsystems, and I worked under Eric Schmidt, who at the time was running the software products division at Sun. I was the product manager for C++, and by the way, being a product manager was a great job. I had transitioned from starting out in technical support and consulting on expert systems into product management. Uh, and the reason product management is so interesting is that you really get to, to, to be responsible for every element of taking a lump of technology and getting it out to the world and making it successful. Everything from defining the features, uh, the really technical elements of the product, to the business model, licensing, branding, 
to the partnerships, everything about getting that technology out to the world. So I was a product manager for C++ and object-oriented technologies working in, working in that software products division under Eric. And then I found out about an internal Skunk Works project at Sun. A small team of Sun's best software engineers were envisioning a future world in which there would be this ubiquitous network and we'd all be connected to it and we'd receive our news and information, entertainment, and we'd collaborate and communicate across this ubiquitous network. All sorts of different devices would be connected to it. And a, a book actually called Mirror Worlds, written by Professor David Galertner from Yale University, was a major inspiration uh, for this team in envisioning this world. Now, these engineers had the audacity to believe that they could build a new kind of software environment designed for this future ubiquitous network that didn't yet exist. And remember, this is years before the web came along. This is the basically 1991 time frame. In fact, Steve Jobs knew about these guys. He knew how good they were, and he tried to get them to come to Next, where he was running, which he had founded and was running. But Scott McNeely convinced them to stay, a small team of Sun's best engineers, and said, I'll actually start a project. Not only will I start a project, I'll spin out a company, a separate company. It was called First Person. It was located in downtown Palo Alto, far away from the Sun, Sun Microsystems headquarters. And it was under the radar. No one at Sun knew that this existed. And so when I found out about this project uh, and realized uh, they needed a product manager, it was really largely just an engineering team, I joined. I found out they needed a product manager, and I joined as the founding product manager of this technology. So when I think about what Scott did, had done in taking this bet on this team and, in fact, spending you know, quite a bit of money in spinning out a whole separate company and this team with this audacious goal of changing the world, uh, it, it's pretty extraordinary when I look back to it. So this technology was called Oak at the time, and we had one simple goal, ubiquity. For everyone on the team, it really was about achieving ubiquity or going home. There was, no, there was no middle ground. And for a long time, we really struggled to find a business model, to find a way to get this technology out to the world. But the device market was nascent. And in fact, the Newton, this was the, the, the era of the Newton, Apple's first uh, smartphone, or uh, PDA as they called them at the time. Uh, but it was, it was visionary, but way too early. And there was a lot of talk about the information superhighway, uh, but that really was largely based on a cable network and early, act, early interactive TV trials that companies like Time Warner were running. And the set-top boxes for these interactive TV trials weren't consumer devices, they were really $25,000 SGI boxes. So we kept trying to figure out how to get this very powerful technology out to the world, but with the constraints of a world that wasn't yet ready for it. The PC and, to a lesser extent, the Mac really were the dominant platforms. And nascent online services like CompuServe and AOL, they were growing, but they were being largely used for email. Uh, so this was a challenge. And Oak, uh, which we had renamed Java, really was uh, incredibly powerful technology that we were failing at getting out to the world. And then the University of Illinois re released Mosaic. Uh, the team downloaded it and realized immediately that we could bring interactivity to the web. And up till now, up till then, in fact, Mosaic, the first um, version of Mosaic, was just uh, capable of displaying static text. And we realized we could create the world's first interactive browser and bring interactivity to the web. So this team created that browser. It was called Hot Java. And we then opened the Java development environment to a limited number of software engineers, software developers, friends of ours, who built the first set of applets. And these applets were really pretty groundbreaking. Uh, for example, one of the first ones that I saw was uh, you would run the, the mouse over the image of a human body. It was a, uh, basically a sort of torso. And as you did that, you would see these MRI slices in real time displaying you know, a series of images that had been taken. Uh, another applet showed a portfolio that was calculating the, the net worth of an individual in real time with these live spreadsheets. Again, kind of dummied up, but 
uh, it showed the power of what the web could be that was not just about linking to more text. This was really, really revolutionary stuff. And once we had the first set of Java applets, again, developed by, um, by um, some, some very smart and creative engineers, uh, we realized that it was ready for prime time. We uh, released Java to the world, open and free. Scott and uh, Bill Joy and, and Sunboard uh, supported that decision. We published a fully, uh, the fully published spec, and we released it on March, 19, March 23, 1995. And it was an extraordinary time. Mosaic was out. Netscape had just been founded. It was called Mosaic Communication at the time. And Java took off like wildfire. And it was because it really was the right technology at the right time. And it succeeded for several reasons. There was this audacious vision that this engineering team had and stuck with and, and in fact, developed into a very powerful technology, the superior design and implementation of Java speaks for itself, uh, given the fact that it still is really the, the lingua franca of the internet today. It was open, and the fact that developers could download it, use it, build applets, and show its power really is what fueled the excitement and the, the proliferation of Java. And the team was persistent. We were persistent in the face of repeated setbacks. This team was not going to stop until we got Java out to the world. So now this story, I tell you the story, not to say how great it, we were, but to say this is a very typical story, actually. This happens all the time in Silicon Valley. Teams like this come up with big, crazy, audacious ideas. They're too early. They fail a bunch of times, and then they succeed. Sometimes they don't get the technology out to the world. But it takes these repeated efforts and continuing to come at the problem and figuring out what will work in the world that exists today before the world that we envision and we know will one day be here. Um, timing really is, is everything. But it's also the hardest thing to control. And for the Java team, of course, the timing of Mosaic could not have been better. It was the perfect vehicle to get this technology out to the world at a critical moment. But it really was kind of random luck that that timing worked out the way it did. I did learn that lesson repeatedly, though, uh, again and again, great technology in and of itself is not enough. And in fact, I first learned that lesson at the very first company I worked for in the Valley. It was an AI software company, and our product was a platform for building expert systems. This was back in the mid-'80s. Uh, and the only machines powerful enough to run this technology were, for example, Symbolics machines that cost upwards of $40,000, $50,000, uh, Xerox, Xerox 1186 boxes. These were state-of-the-art machines at the time, but also incredibly expensive and, of course, limited the market as a result. We had lots of enthusiastic customers at Fortune 100 co uh, companies, but ultimately it was clear this market was small and we were not going to be able to get kind of um, velocity in, in the world that existed. It was a sobering lesson to realize that the breakthrough technology, the breakthrough capabilities of our software was not enough to result in market success. Um, and that experience not only taught me about the importance of timing, but also technology trends and, uh, and sort of the, the human emotional uh, roller coaster that the industry often goes through. By the end of the 80s, AI companies were declining. They were going bust. And conventional wisdom was that AI was dead. It had all been a pipe dream. This vision of advanced intelligence and computing, in fact, would never happen. But fast forward a couple decades later, here we are, and AI is everywhere. Uh, we may not have solved the Turing test quite yet, but on a daily basis, Siri talks to us, and fuzzy logic is determining the temperature in our washing machines. And over coming years, obviously, that only will become more true. AI really is being, becoming embedded in everyday life. We just don't call it AI anymore. So this has long been true, that people get excited about a hot area of technology, over-interpret how quickly it'll all happen, and, and then when the expected results, when the revolution doesn't happen, the premature death of that category is pronounced. And entrepreneur and early Apple employee Jean-Louis Gasset has observed 
that the venture industry is full of visionary sheep who get caught up in these cycles. And to be fair, it's not just venture. It really is human nature. The tech industry can be worse than Fifth Avenue fashion houses. And I've learned through living through enough of these cycles, these premature death announcements like enterprise software is dead, search is dead, internet advertising is dead, to know that when conventional wisdom is pronouncing the death and writing the obituaries of entire categories, that's when the really interesting stuff is actually happening because that's when the entrepreneurs, when the developers are, don't have enough time to even argue with those silly pronouncements, they're too busy innovating. They're too busy inventing the future. And uh, to talk about trends, that leads me to the topic of bubbles. And the big irony of the bubble bursting at the end of uh, the 90s was in essence that really all the ideas of the 90s for the most part were correct. They were just about a decade later or so than everyone predicted. Uh, Mark Andreessen points out that diapers.com recently was bought by Amazon for about $450 million. Well, why is this? How could this be? Well, it turns out that the market just wasn't ready. There were about 150 million people online around the year 2000, in the late 90s. Today, it's closer to 2.5 billion people online. And it's not uncommon at all. This, this, this sort of phenomenon is not uncommon, seeing companies fail the first time they try something, and then someone comes along five years later, and it works, and it's huge, because the world is ready for it. Some people call this the last mover advantage, and there is some wisdom to it. Companies like mp3.com and Napster, they were first generation. And a decade or so later, of course, after they failed, Spotify and Pandora made it big. Friendster was first. Facebook achieved uh, escape velocity and created the franchise. And the list goes on. And the reality is, it really does take time to build value. Not only can you be too early, but on top of that, it takes time to actually build the sustaining value you need to be successful. You, know, you hear a lot of stories about startups that are, that are overnight successes, that, that, that seemingly you know, came out of nowhere, grab headlines, they're, they're worth 100 million, they've got uh, incredible valuations, and not only that, but revenue. That actually is quite rare. In most cases, it takes years. And, and, at least a couple of generations of companies running at the problem, if it's a really interesting problem, before, with many sacrifices in the process, before success finally comes. Examples of this are really everywhere, not only companies, but categories. So 15 years now after the term e-commerce was coined, online commerce is finally on the brink of massive change today, finally. We've been able to order products on the web for years now, but other than that basic utility, commerce basically has been stuck in the 20th century. Siloed, static data stores, not, not a lot of really intelligent information being, being conveyed beyond just the ability to order stuff. But finally today, real-time data analytics are getting more and more useful, so advertisers know, are starting to know better, what works based on actual use. This next wave of innovation will incorporate real data, transactions, and actual usage, and more than just user reviews that a few people may have chose, chosen to, to post. So that's e-commerce. Digital cash in the late 90s is another example. So like the, the flying car of the 60s or the space tourist of the 70s, everyone assumed that digital cash was right around the corner in you know, circa 1997-98. Now, fortunes have been made, PayPal most uh, prominently, and others, and also lost by countless companies trying to take a run at digital cash. But 15 years later, we still carry around bits of plastic and paper. Of course, the infrastructure of the financial system is slow to evolve, and that is something that's outside the control of, of any innovator. But over the past year, I'm finally starting to see some really interesting innovative startups that are bringing products to market now uh, that are providing new kinds of payment systems. 
that are actually moving the needle on, beginning to move the needle on, on how the financial market works in a small way. It's a small way. But over time, and it's not going to take a lot of time now, these new kind of payment systems will become this new app platform that at long last will enable these intuitive apps that will be able to anticipate our preferences based on who we are and where we're located and what we've done and what we need. So here we are 15 years later, finally on the brink of that, and it's going to be big. And the entrepreneurs are inventing it, not the banking industry. In fact, uh, some call this new category Bank 2.0. And these companies are, more often than not, they're, they're all for profit, but more often than not, they're very focused on, on being also pro-consumer. They're providing products that actually don't need to employ the predatory lending practices, high interest rates, penalties, fees, this, this very um, entrenched infrastructure of the banking system that actually, unfortunately, also has its roots in the cost of the banking system, which includes lots of bricks and mortar and lots of big bonuses to bank executives. At the same time, these companies are beginning to develop, invent products that help millions of people who've been locked out of the traditional banking environment the ca and who exist really in a cash-only economy. Some people refer to these folks as the unbanked or the underbanked. And they are often, too often, exploited by payday lenders uh, and others. And, and for the first time now, they're beginning to get access to the banking system and they're beginning to have new opportunities to pay for goods and services without having to have a bank account. So just one example, uh, thanks to a startup called Pay Near Me, today people who don't have bank accounts can actually go to their local 7-Eleven and pay their utility bill and other bills uh, because 7-Eleven is essentially acting as the proxy to conduct that bill payment system, again, through this technology coming from a startup. This is revolutionary stuff, and it really will create significant, profound, and lasting change in the financial system. We're just at the beginning of it, uh, but it's happening. And not only that, but new forms of virtual currency are emerging, new forms of currency which are virtual. It's early days, they're problems. Uh, fraud, security issues are rampant, but the entrepreneurs are innovating, they're iterating, they're, they're, they're figuring out what's not working, they're fixing it, they're going back out there. And it's gonna take some time, but it's going to happen in a matter of not decades, but years, a few years. And the bank 2.0 companies, these, this new generation of companies that get it right, will not only return value for their investors, but they're also creating deep and lasting value in the system itself. They're creating far greater transparency, and they're also freeing up enormous amounts of money that today goes towards paying high interest fees and is not going towards driving GDP or college savings or retirement, you know, the kinds of things that we really need in order for our economy to have strong underpinnings. So I get excited about that stuff because this is a combination of audacious entrepreneurs, great technology, and changing fundamental markets and systems for the better. And it's all coming from audacious entrepreneurs. But Returning to the larger point, all of this will take time. And most entrepreneurs tend to ignore the fact that, in fact, in many cases, it really does take 10 to 15 years to create long-term institutional sustainable value. And just because you don't have hyper-growth right out the gate does not mean that you're a failure. It may mean, and it probably does mean, that you have to figure out the business model, you have to experiment, you have to iterate, while you're still driving for that long-term audacious goal. PayPal's first model was actually uh, sending money between Palm Pilots. That was their first business model. And they went through four more business models before they finally hit the one that worked. Amazon went the first six years without turning a profit. And uh, finally, in 2001, they earned a paltry $5 million, albeit on a billion, in revenue. But that's not so long ago. Today, Amazon is actually, of course, synonymous with online shopping, and it has a market cap of over $100 billion. So these things take time. And by the way, Amazon was pronounced dead a few times during that whole decade as well. 
So the bottom line is it's best typically to start with a small specific problem that you're solving, experiment, and then keep iterating until you get it right. And don't get shaken when you fail, because you will. You'll, you'll fail several times. Keep that long-term vision, but don't get locked into how you're going to get there. And be willing to be patient. And you might think of it as failing fast while sticking with it. That's basically the formula that works. And building a company really is incredibly hard. I mean, from the outside, maybe it looks kind of glamorous, but in fact, it's long hours, it's routine setbacks, it's emotional roller coasters, it's incredible highs and lows and, and roadblocks, it's incredibly draining, and it wears on everybody. And the only way that people on the team want to put in that 18th hour to, to fix a bug or to launch a site is that they're there for something beyond the paycheck. And for the best companies, the most successful entrepreneurs, Getting paid really is just a byproduct of getting to change the world. Now, for many investors, these, these sort of messianic, uh, visionary entrepreneurs seem naive or worse. And they, they're kind of scared of these crazy entrepreneurs. But really, the best investors only want to back those kind of people because they know that this single-minded passion will not only get the company off the ground, but it's... Most importantly, what's needed to ensure that the founders and the team stick with it when things get tough, and they will. So most companies, as I said, go through several different business models before they finally find the one that worked. And in the case of Marimba, we left uh, after launching Java at Sun, I left with three of my colleagues, and we founded a company called Marimba. This was in 1996, and we were in the process, really, of, of delivering the first enterprise software systems for companies to use the internet to run their operations and to do businesses, business. So at Marimba, the question was, they had, my co-founders had written this amazing, very powerful technology to automate the deployment and management of software across networks. This was really revolutionary stuff. It was a very powerful, very well-designed system. Remember, these were three guys who wrote major components of the Java system, so this was a great product. Um, but the question was, we faced this, this question about six months in, what direction to take? And there were really kind of two paths. One was the consumer internet, basically delivering automated updates of content of interest to consumers like news, sports scores, weather, et cetera, to, uh, to um, PCs and, and, and devices, largely PCs. The other was the enterprise, automating the management of software application deployment and management in, in the enterprise. So this was a tough choice, and because we knew we, we really only kind of got one shot at this, if we got it wrong, it was really going to be tough to retrench and start over again. So we chose enterprise. Fortunately, we chose right, because that ended up being the market that was there, and that was not a random choice. It was very deliberate. We looked at where the demand was. It turned out the consumer internet, really the network wasn't ready for it. Um, the demand wasn't there yet from the consumer. But in the enterprise, they were struggling with systems like, um, you know, sort of the, the, the old systems like Tivoli and others that were only capable of sending software down the hall, not outside the, the bricks and mortars of that company. So they had a huge need to be able to use the internet, and we had the solution to doing that. Um, so despite the fact that the, the customers loved the product and we built a very successful company, this was tough. It was a tough road. It was a seven-year experience, um, lots of ups and downs. Uh, we had a great exit, but it, it's never easy. It may look like that from the outside, but it's never easy. And you're, you're making life and death decisions uh, really on a daily basis. So that brings me to teams. So while timing and technology really matter, teams do too, in fact, usually more. And for the entrepreneur, the team, sometimes you forget that the team includes your investors. So some entrepreneurs really focus on getting money in the door and kind of ignore or don't, don't put a lot of credence in where that money comes from. It's money. Get started. But 
companies can be mismanaged, not only by the founders, but also by the investors. So it's really important to consider who you're letting on your team. And if you look across the industry, about half of founders who are CEOs are actually uh, replaced within the first three years by their, their venture capital, their, their investors. And more often than not, this is in an attempt to introduce so-called adult supervision. But in fact, for the first few years of a company, almost always, I, I would say, with some exceptions, but typically, the founding team and the founding CEO is the best person to take that company to, to the first stage of escape velocity at, at, at minimum. And the reason is that, and, and that's despite a founder's lack of business experience. This is not, I'm not talking about someone with an MBA. I'm talking about a, really a, typically a product-oriented CEO. And the reason is that things get tough. And the founding team that came up with a vision are always the ones that are singularly driven to achieve that vision no matter what it takes. Someone that you're bringing in the door within the first three years typically is, does, does not have that drive. And those first two or three years are absolutely critical to getting a company to a, a point where it can actually become a successful, long-term, sustainable um, organization. Now, CEOs aren't born. Um, you really, this is a job that you can't go to school to learn how to do. Being a CEO actually is a learnable skill, and most CEOs become, learn how to do the job while they're on the job. And now that said, it's, there's no substitute for, for great management, but it's not necessary to have an MBA or have worked at McKinsey to be a great CEO, and of course the examples of this are all around us here in the Seattle area, uh, and, and elsewhere in the Valley. What you do need as a CEO, if you're an entrepreneur thinking about founding a company and maybe this is a role that you may be taking at some point, you, you need good instincts about people. And you need the ability to cut through the noise and figure out what really matters because there's a lot of noise around and a lot of competing uh, interests and, and, and things vying for your attention. So you have to you have to figure out what matters and then get everyone galvanized and focused on doing that. It sounds simple, it sounds basic, it sounds obvious, but in fact, that's what all great CEOs do every single day, and it's not easy. It's not easy at all. What that said, uh, really nothing in the end beats the satisfaction of being on a mission with people you respect, changing the world in some way, large or small. There's just nothing better in it than that. And the people that you go into the trenches with really become your sort of informal alumni network. And for most entrepreneurs, it's far more important that alumni network, that, that sort of evolving uh, collection of relationships and people that you know, than the degree you earned or even the companies you worked at. And this really, these interconnecting networks of people, these, these virtuous circles which, in which people help each other in whatever way necessary, uh, whether they're starting another company or just need advice, this is the way the valley works. This is, in fact, what powers the valley when people come from all parts of the world uh, and, and, and want to know what makes this work. It's, it's those interconnected networks of people helping each other. That's it. That's, it's really as simple as that. Helping each other change the world. And that's what happens anywhere. Great innovation happens at scale, not just the valley. And it's also uh, quite, quite rare, because there aren't a lot of places that happens in the world today. This is also one of those places, the Seattle area. But it's different. It's very different than most industries, where success is really heavily dependent on your pedigree and your ability to advance through some hierarchical structure and within a very limited ecosystem. And that's really the way most of the world works. And you know, when I think about that, uh, the financial meltdown that we've had has been tough, but in fact, there's a silver lining to it, and that is that some of the best and brightest, and most of them, used to go into banking as their first choice right out of school. Today, more and more graduates, best and brightest all over the world, are actually choos to be choosing to become entrepreneurs, which was, was kind of scary uh, only a few years ago to, to most people, especially in, in cultures where that's viewed as risky at best. Traveling in Europe 
recently, I was, I was struck by the fact that it's finally becoming culturally acceptable to graduate from school and go do a startup. And ironically, even though anyone can start a company from anywhere and with a laptop, uh, with Amazon Web Services, uh, with an open source stack, you can really launch a sizable business from your living room anywhere in the world. But many are flocking to Silicon Valley. I mean, every day there's another team from Czechoslovakia or Denmark or uh, India coming to the valley to start a company. Oftentimes, the development team is in the home country, and they're bringing people through, cycling people through to the, the core team that's in, in Silicon Valley or San Francisco. But they want to be in these hubs of innovation because that's where, that's where the talent is. That's where... That's where the largest ecosystem exists, and that's where the feeling is so pervasive that anything is possible. And that really is hard to find in the world that, that exists today. It, it shouldn't be, but it is. And uh, I think oftentimes we kind of get spoiled in the technology industry and in, in the Valley in particular, uh, thinking that that, that's, that's, that happens everywhere. It doesn't. It's rare. And it needs to happen everywhere, but uh, at this point, it's not. And that leads me to a final point, which is that innovation really does not happen in a vacuum. It's not just about the entrepreneurs. An entrepreneurial culture can grow organically, but there also needs to be a foundation of intentional policies that help foster that and accelerate that innovation, that, that innovation economy. Now, that means policy, and policy means politics, and that sounds suspicious. And in fact, engineers and entrepreneurs often view politics as really sort of irrelevant, detached from their world, and even distasteful. And there's, there is, you know, admittedly a lot uh, about politics that is distasteful. But for engineers, for entrepreneurs, <laughs> yes, good point. For entrepreneurs and innovators, the time to stand on the sidelines on this stuff is over because our capacity to innovate is directly dependent on policies, the policies that really underpin our economy. Now, I think that was really brought into sharp focus with the recently proposed SOPA and PIPA legislation that were and stand for Stop Online Piracy Act and Intellectual Property Act, uh, Protect IP Act, sorry. Those pieces of proposed legislation uh, were, were really a wake-up call for the technology industry, a very timely example. So, quick background, the, this, techno, this uh, legislation was backed by the entertainment industry largely, and it, it, with a very well-meaning goal to fight online piracy, which is I I incredibly important. But the way that SOPA and PIPA proposed going about it could have required websites like Google to actually monitor what people link to or upload and then ultimately could have given governments to, to actually apply the kind of censorship on the web that are being used, that's being used in, in countries like Iran or China. I mean, it was, it, was, it was that bad. So, for example, if a website was accused of having some copyrighted material, this site could be blocked from ISPs, and not only that, it could be de-indexed, de-indexed from search engines, and all that could happen without due process. And this was legislation that was really on the brink of being signed into law. So now, while these proposed bill, bills were actually aimed at foreign-owned websites, nevertheless, they absolutely would have impacted U.S. companies and some of the biggest technology companies in the world based here in the U.S. And again, while fighting online piracy is a critically important goal, Going about it in the right way is equally important, and targeting the platform providers like SOPA and PIPA proposed instead of the copyright infringers was not the right way of going about it. So at the 11th hour, shortly before this proposed legislation went to vote, and there was a lot of momentum behind it, in an unprecedented act of industry self-organization, we mobilized, and major sites like Google blacked out their home pages, put a big black... Uh, Kind of banned across the home pages. So this this was shocking. I was in D.C. around this time, and the the politicians really couldn't believe it. And as an industry, we, we finally had found our voice. It was it was late, but we had found our voice collectively. 
And that furor halted the progress of that legislation and actually got us to the table with the entertainment industry and others who care about fighting online piracy to come up with solutions that actually were both effective, uh, attacked the problem, but also didn't undermine the whole economy. So the, story, the moral of the story is that innovation and policy are tightly, incredibly tightly linked. And as technologists and business leaders, we need to be engaged in this discussion. We need to be, we need to be part of forming policy, not just sitting on the sidelines. Another very timely example is immigration, of course. Uh, the US economy became the economic powerhouse it is by attracting the best and brightest from all over the world. But of course, in a post 9-11 environment, it's become incredibly difficult for many scientists and engineers born in other countries to stay here. So what we've been doing is educating our best and brightest and making it really difficult for other countries' best and brightest, and then making it really difficult for them to stay and build companies and continue to help really change the world, as has been happening over the last few decades. So immigration has become this politicized hot potato at, at the critical moment where, as we said earlier, as I noted earlier, we're facing this shortage, this, this huge shortage of engineering talent. I mean, the two could not be converging at a worse moment. So meaningful immigration reform is clearly critically important. And again, we've got to be engaged in that discussion. And finally, uh, just on this topic of policy education, education is really that policy issue that has the highest stakes. Our computer science supply problem has its roots in the K through 12 public education system because uh, it's clear that out of the gate we're starting from behind. And you only have to look at the high school dropout rates to, to know that this is true. Nationwide, the high school dropout rate is 25%. 25% of high school students drop out, never graduate. How could this be? And for other uh, areas and underrepresented populations, it's even worse. So in the, in the worst school districts, you're seeing dropout rates of 35, 45, even over 50%. So as a nation, here we are spending more money on K through 12 education than every other industrialized country other than Switzerland. We spend more money than every other industrialized country. And yet we're 35th in math and 29th in science achievement worldwide. That is shocking. It's clearly not acceptable, and, and there's also not a simple solution. But among other things, we need new approaches to teaching and learning. We need new ways of imparting teaching the skills that 21st century jobs require. And high schools need to start teaching core competencies, co competencies not just in math and English and social studies, but in critical thinking and system level problem solving, and in collaboration across groups and learning how to influence people and in problem solving that involves creativity and imagination. And the ability to find and analyze huge amounts of data. I mean, these, are, these are the critical skills of 21st century jobs, not just in computing, but every job ultimately will require those kinds of skills. So this, this really is a personal uh, issue for me or something I feel strongly about because I was lucky to grow up in a place, Berkeley, California, that was near uh, an institution called the Lawrence Hall of Science. It's a science museum. And when I was about 12 years old, I got hooked on a program called ELISA, which, of course, is one of the seminal AI programs that demonstrated natural language processing. It was developed in the mid-60s. So ELISA mimicked a psychiatrist who kept asking you how you were feeling. And you would answer. And then she wouldn't, she wouldn't give it up. <laughs> she kept at you and saying, but why do you feel that way? And so I was able, as a 12-year-old kid, to have this conversation with a computer. And I was absolutely fascinated. What was the software that made this possible? Who wrote it? How did it work? And then it became really fun to get Eliza to kind of go into these dead ends. Because at a certain point, she kind of ran out of gas. And I was fascinated. And this was my first exposure to computing. So my interest in computing was peaked at the, er the age of 12, and it opened up this whole world to me that otherwise I wouldn't have had the opportunity to experience in that way. It was fun. It was, it was fascinating. It was an exploration. And every kid should have an opportunity like this. Every kid doesn't have a Lawrence Hall of Science down the street, but in our 
education system, this is the kind of experience that we should be enabling. Tony Wagner, who's the author of The Global Achievement Gap, which I think is a great book, uh, points out the following. He says, we've created an economy based on people spending money they do not have to buy things they may not need, threatening the planet in the process. That's basically the economy that we've created. And we need to transition from a consumer-driven economy, which is a one we've built, and, and it's huge, and it's, 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 a, it's, it's a global powerhouse, but it's not sustainable. We need to transition from a consumer-driven economy to an innovation-driven economy. And getting involved and helping shape public policy is key. So I'd like to conclude with some, some thoughts for aspiring entrepreneurs. Sometimes I'm asked, what company should I go to? And I think that better than asking where you should go, what company to go to is first thinking about what you want to do. What do you believe in? What problem in the world do you think needs solving? What's broken that you think you can fix? Those, those are the questions to ask. And I'd also say get experience at companies large and small. It's, it's um, today kind of cool to start a company right out of college, but in fact, you'll lack some important context. And I, I wouldn't have traded those seven years at Sun Microsystems for anything. I certainly wouldn't have met my three co-founders that enabled me to have this experience of founding a company. Uh, and I wouldn't have learned how, how business partnerships work, just an enormous number of things that you, you really can't trade, experiences you can't trade and you, you can't know until you live them. And that said, although no one seeks it, Failure can also be incredibly valuable. Failing, and we've all done it, anyone who's been in the industry, tests you like nothing else. It is the best way to know what you're capable of, what you can live with, and what you can't live with. It has a way of sharpening your focus, uh, not only in your work, but in your life. And in fact, most people who are successful don't have perfect hockey sticks. They, in hockey stick paths, more often than not, they fail their way on the way to success, many failures on the way to success. That's the way it works. And I like to, when I think about, when I go through one of these phases, uh, and it's happened numerous times, and it will probably happen numerous times again, there's an ancient Japanese proverb that says, fall, fall, fall down seven times and stand up eight. That proverb I live by, and I think every entrepreneur Every innovator does. And in fact, engineers and scientists understand that better than most. And I think Einstein said it best. He said, it's not that I'm smarter than anyone else. It's that I stay with problems longer. So with that, I'll conclude. And again, thank you, Ed, for inviting me. And thank you all. <laughs>